first of all, I'd like to uh, ask anybody that worked for Commodore uh, who's in the room to stand up and wave at the people, like you, Andy. Go over here. All right. I know there were a few more, but I think... He stepped out. He, heard, he knew what this talk was going to be like, so he decided to bail. <laughs> so uh, I put this slide up to start because I, um, I've worked at a lot of places over the years. I'm currently at Amazon, and I'm also a city councilman in Gaithersburg, Maryland. But uh, I worked at Commodore for three and a half years, Atari for four years, Genie, which was an online service at General Electric for five, Simutronics video game, online video game company for almost 20 years. And I'm at Amazon, and like I said, I'm a city councilman, so um, I've tried to keep busy over the years. My wife says I'm never going to get to retire. Very sad about that. So this talk today is called Tales from an Interesting Career. How do you do all this stuff without getting a page on Wikipedia? Um, I could have also said, how do you not end up getting rich? Because I'm basically the same age as Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. Started my career at the same time, and somehow you know, didn't work out that way, but I've had fun. So let's talk about having fun. I know a lot of the talks uh, that I watched on streaming yesterday were very technical. Um, this is gonna be much less technical. So if you're here to hear about chips and engineering, you might wanna leave and go to another talk. Um, so what did I do at Commodore? I, I, I'm, this is before the good story, so you can zone out on this part, but basically, um, I joined the company and wrote several user manuals, wrote some games in the first year. I wrote the VIC-20 user manual on my own personal typewriter, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, I edited the programmer's reference guide for the VIC and uh, wrote the basic section. Um, I also wrote the basic section in the C64 programmer's reference guide. I took over Commodore magazines and ran Commodore Microcomputer and PowerPlay magazine for a few years. And then when I left the company, I went to Atari and revived their magazine and called it Atari Explorer. I did a bunch of stuff, which I'll talk about later. And then I went to GE and I also did the magazines there. So that was a kind of sideline. And basically the idea was when I first started working in home computer business in the late 70s, the documentation was terrible. One of the missions that I had in life was to make sure that people understood how to actually work these computers and didn't have to hack around on the keyboard and try to figure stuff out. So, the reason, this is a picture that I just took a few months ago of 1700 Samsung Street in Center City, Philadelphia. This was my first job in the home computer business. Back then, this was a story called Mr. Calculator. And basically, I had been working as a programmer uh, writing accounting systems in BASIC, which I didn't find very exciting. In high school, I learned to program and wrote a lot of games. Uh, and when you're writing an accounting system, it's much less fun and much more repetitive. But I saw that in the newspaper one day that there was a computer store selling home computers that was looking for help. And I thought, this sounds like much more fun. So I called up and got a, an interview with Gene Beals, who was the manager of the store. And the interview was scheduled for 2 p.m. one day. And I went in at 2 p.m. and the store was absolutely jammed. And the only employee was Gene. And he was, the Commodore had run a full page ad the day before with discounts on Commodore calculators. And the store was absolutely packed. And off to the side was a Commodore 8-bit uh, pet, pet computer with 8K of memory. Um, and people were typing stuff on it. It kept coming back question mark syntax error because they had no idea. And me being a basic guy from way back, I started typing little programs. 10, input, your, your name, semicolon, a dollar sign, 20, print, a dollar sign, semicolon, 30, go to 20. Ooh. <laughs> Very exciting. Took a great, great deal of basic expertise to create that. But you know, the cool thing was that it worked, right? You just boot it up in basic and you could write software. So I basically fooled around with the computer and entertained the crowd for about four hours until 6 p.m. when the store closed, and then finally got my interview, and Gene called me the next day and offered me the job, which I took. So that was my intro to Commodore. Over the next six or nine months that I worked there, um, we spent a lot of time goofing around with the computer and trying to figure out what was there. We documented every um, 
abbreviation for every basic command, where you could type the first letter and ship the second letter and things like that, because none of that was documented. Uh, Gene published a user group newsletter that a lot of that went into. So there was a lot of kind of figuring it out and going on in the user community because so little was documented. Um, that store, though, didn't really have a future because Commodore insisted that because it was a company-owned store that we weren't allowed to discount the price at all. And there were other stores across town who were happy to discount but had no expertise. They couldn't explain the computer, so people would come to us. We would teach them everything about the computer and then they'd go buy it for $100 less across town. So I guess six months after I left the store, uh, a truck pulled up from Commodore and unloaded all the merchandise and shut it down. So that was a wonderful retail experience, but it was a, an interesting way to learn the computer. Um, so that was me back in the day, by the way, uh, in my basement with my own pet computer, which I still have, a CBM 8032 with an extra 64K memory board in it. Um, so in the intervening time after I left Mr. Calculator, I bounced back and forth between programming jobs and sales jobs in retail. Um, my last retail job was for a store called, uh, called Computerland in Dresher, Pennsylvania, um, which sold a lot of CPM machines, a lot of Apple IIs. We sold Atari 8-bit computers. Um, i trying to think what else. I think that was most of what we sold. I had, I had a Commodore pet there, but nobody actually bought it from us as well. Um, I also was uh, offered the opportunity to earn a few extra dollars by teaching basic programming classes on the Apple II, which I thought was fun. And uh, I taught probably half a dozen classes for people learning the introductory AppleSoft Basic. Um, and I also got to become really good at Star Raiders on the Atari uh, 800 computer. Um, I wrote some articles for uh, Compute Magazine a couple of programs that I wrote that ended up as articles. I, I, I got an article in the Compute's first book of Atari, um, which ended up paying pretty nice royalties because you got a small slice of the, uh, of the retail sales for that, so that was fun. But um, then my mother called me up one day, one day and said she just heard on a radio show in Philadelphia that Commodore was holding an open house. They, were, they had just moved their headquarters from California to Pennsylvania, and we're looking for people, and uh, maybe I should check it out. And it seemed like a golden opportunity for me. So I went to the open house and was greeted by a charming HR lady, and she said, what are you looking for? And I said, well, I'm a, I'm a basic programmer. I've been doing this professionally for almost 10 years. Um, I've been selling computers. In fact, I know the Commodore Pet computer very well because I work for Mr. Calculator. Um, I've written articles in computer magazines, and by the way, I heard about this new color computer that you guys are putting out for a few hundred dollars, and I'd love to learn more while I'm here. And while I'm talking, her eyes are getting bigger and bigger, because in 1981, there weren't very many people who could tell a story like that, and she said, let me bring you over to Mike Tomchek right away. So I met Mike Tomchek and um, got the interview and the job, and uh, my first assignment was to write the VIC-20 user manual. The VIC-20 user manual had been assigned to an outside company called Redgate Communications, um, and they wrote a, a draft of the manual, and Mike gave it to me and said, this is crap. We have to throw this away and start over again. They did a terrible job. We need to actually teach people how to use this computer. And I read it, and I, I kind of agreed with his assessment, and said, okay, where's my word processor? He said, well, so back in those days, the VIC-20 was still probably six months from being launched. And um, the people that we were housed in an office with a bunch of people who were busy selling pets to computer stores, and they didn't really get the whole cheap home, uh, home computer in color thing. They thought it would be something that you gave away free as a souvenir when you bought a real computer. And I mean, that's actually a direct quote from one of our, uh, one of our directors. Um, and we knew better. We knew we had lightning in a bottle with this thing. So, um, so he said, I can't get you a computer yet. It's going to take a few weeks. And I said, OK, well, I have a typewriter that I used in college. Let me get started. So I brought in my trusty Smith Corona uh, typewriter and 
I had been teaching basic, so I knew, I mean, I knew this inside and out. I knew the Commodore basic. So about two weeks, start to finish, I wrote the text for the manual. Uh, Mike put a lot of the cool little, cute little uh, Big 20 guy pictures and thought balloons that you may remember for the, for the book. Um, and the rest of the team helped put the appendices together. Mike said at one point, we need 20 sound effects. So I wrote 20 sound effects. Um, and so that was a lot of fun. It was very rewarding because people, I think it was probably the first user manual of the day that actually taught you enough to be dangerous on the computer. And so I was very proud of that. Um, so this next story is called We Don't Talk About Bruno. Um, there, are, there are people that you've heard of from the Commodore days and people that you haven't heard of. And so this is a quick story about one member of the Vic Commando team that we don't talk about and nobody knows who he was and this is long gone. But this was a person who was a classic programmer that you never introduce in public. Um, sat in his office and wrote code, wrote assembly language and basic code. Um, and was working on some of the cartridge game ports that we were doing. Um, some of what we, some of the games that we got from Japan were beautiful reproductions of arcade games uh, like Lunar Lander and Pac-Man and things like that that were perfect reproductions and with one problem. We didn't have the U.S. rights to those games at all. We were copyright violations. They had been licensed to Atari. They were allowed to sell them in Japan, but we didn't have the rights to them. So our team of people, including Andy here, got to create Radar Rat Race, which was originally Rally X, but instead of racing cars, and oil slicks that were now mice and cheese and cats. Um, Pac-Man became uh, Cosmic Cruncher, I think, uh, and so on. So this per person who we will now call Bruno uh, was do writing some of the ports. And after a few months, he was done and the games were working. But it was taking months and months after that before they could actually get into production and out the door. And in the meantime, one day, I opened up a copy of Compute Magazine and saw an ad in the back for a software company that was offering VIC-20 games. And it was some of these titles, that um, the original titles, that looked fantastic. And I mean, honestly, we were just like, thrilled to find a software company that was doing VIC-20 software. And they, oh, by the way, they were two towns over from where Commodore headquarters was, so like, fantastic. So I pick up the phone and I say, hi, this is Neil Harris from Commodore. And they hung up the phone. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, that was unusual. But maybe it was a bad connection. So I dialed again and I said, hello, this is Neil. Click. Click, uh-oh. So I talked to Mike Tomchak. And Mike said, let's go over there and see what's going on. So we drove over to the address in the ad and opened the door. And sure enough, it was Bruno um, attempting to sell the code that we were that we had paid him as a staff member to write for Commodore. Um, because he, frankly, I think he was just naive and impatient that this stuff wasn't getting out the door. Um, but of course, the next thing that Mike said is, oh, you're fired, which is why we don't talk about Bruno. Um, but you know, it was the early days, and people were naive and didn't know better. So that's kind of the stuff that happened. So does anybody remember a, a chain of stores in this region called Kitty City? Yeah. Okay, good stuff. I used to buy a lot of toys and games there. Um, so, in my second year at Commodore, um, the Commodore executives had discovered that I was a person that understood computers, could work them really well, and could also speak to normal people. Which is, we now call people like that sales engineers. That was kind of a name thing. <laughs> but basically, the sales guys drafted me to travel around with them and do demos when they were trying to sell the computers to. And at the time, we were trying to open up the big chains. We needed to get into Kmart and Montgomery Ward and Sears and Kitty City. Interestingly, all the companies that are completely out of business these days, but um, I spent a lot of time on the road with the various VPs of sales and sales directors. Um, so one day, I found myself in Kitty City headquarters with a VIC-20 and a brand new prototype VIC modem, which was uh, just a bare board at the time. And uh, what I like to do, which has been my habit for my entire career, is to get there early, set up the computer, make sure everything's working, 
And frankly, if something turns out to not work, well, that's just never part of the demo. Nobody knows that it wasn't working, right? See, nods in the audience. <laughs> um, so I plug in the VIC-20, I plug in the VIC modem, I turn on the VIC-20, and the red power light comes on and goes off. Like, uh oh. So, take it all apart, take out my handy screwdriver, open up the VIC-20, and sure enough, the fuse is blown. I'm like, okay. Either this is a bad VIC-20, or there's something wrong with the modem, and then I realized the modem had, everybody knows edge connectors from those days, right? And edge connectors are always tabbed, so you know which way to plug it in and which way it doesn't go. Well, this prototype does not have a tab on it. So I went to the telephone and I called Andy. And I said, Andy, if I plug the big modem in upside down, would it blow the fuse in the computer? And Andy went off and talked to some other engineers and came back on the phone and said, we think so. <laughs> and so, excuse me? I think we actually tried it. Yep. <laughs> So, um, so I pulled out the fuse, you know, the little little cylindrical fuse, reached into my pocket and said, here's a three quarters, could kind of fit in there, and uh, yeah. let power go through, and took the motor and put it in the upside down from the way it originally was, and turned it on and crossed my fingers that I wasn't going to burn down Kitty City headquarters, uh, and sure enough, it worked. So, put it all together, did the modem demo, everything worked well. Uh, went home, got my money back, and remembered to bring a fuse with me as a spare every time I traveled, and, and also put a little tab in the edge connector going forward. So, uh, yeah, that could have been a whole different story. So, the Commodore 64 Programmer's <laughs> Reference Guide. So, here I am in my second year at the company. The Commodore 64 has come out, has, has been created and we're busy preparing all the materials. In the meantime, I'm traveling around the country doing my sales engineer thing. And uh, on one weekend, I'm at home and Andy calls me. Andy is like really a deep part of this story, isn't it? Um, Andy calls me up and said, I just read a draft of the uh, Commodore 64 Programmer's Reference Guide. And I said, who wrote it? And he mentioned the name, somebody else who's, uh, we'll call Bruno as well. <laughs> And uh, I said, how is it? And he said, well, there's one problem. It's fiction. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He said, there's like nothing in here that makes any sense, technically. And this was a guy who was hired by the vice president of computer store sales, uh, who I had talked to. And I, because I was looking for like a gig where I wasn't traveling around the country all the time. And I offered my service, he says, I already have a technical guy. He's so smart that when he talks, nobody, I don't understand a word he says. Uh -huh. And I thought, well, none of the engineers understand anything this guy says either. Um, so, and they gave him the assignment of writing this book. So, um, the people that put the Commodore, 60, uh, Commodore VIC-20 book together, uh, Andy and myself, Mike Tomchek, and Paul Higginbottom, who's a young guy from England originally who was working out of Commodore Canada, so we basically got the band back together again. We, all four of us got together, handed out the same, basically the same assignments. I wrote the big section, uh, I mean, sorry, the basic section, and he did the machine code and the memory map, and Mike wrote uh, stuff about software, and Paul did his piece. Uh, and in the course of about a month, with a very tight deadline, because this book was already promised to a publisher, we had to get it out the door, um, we wrote, wrote the entire, Commodore 64 Programmer's Reference Guide in record time, got it out the door and hopefully um, helped a lot of people write a lot of good software. Um, now, going back to the VIC-20 book, we got our names on the front page as authors of the book in alphabetical order, A. Finkel and N. Harris and P. Higginbottom and M. Tomchek. So, but we were, we had been told in no uncertain terms that we were not getting our names in this book or in ever again. And we thought, look, we have just been heroes here, right? We saved the frickin' day for Commodore to get this book together. We deserve at least to get some credit for it. So we went to Jack Trammell, and we told him our story, and Jack laughed. And he said, look, I'll make you a deal. You can get your names in the book, and I'll pay you a royalty, but you have to not get paid any more a salary. 
and I'm like 26 years old at the time, and I've got a mortgage and a wife, and, and none of us were in a position to take that deal. And so we were like, okay, whatever. Don't put our names in the book if it has to be, if it has to be that way. And I understand that Jack made this offer to many people who asked for royalties or credit over the years and knew he was always going to win that deal, which is why Jack made hundreds of millions of dollars and I'm still standing here with my, you know, without my hundreds of millions of dollars. <laughs> and, uh, um, and so, first of all, he offered us the deal of the century because that book sold millions of copies and any small royalty would have more than made up for any salary that we missed. We probably would have gone without lunches for a few months, but would have worked out to our advantage. Um, but he was, he took care of us. I mean, we got raises and we got stock options and things like that over time. So, um, and Jack was pretty famous for Jack attacks, where if you, if you came to him and he asked you for something and you try to BS your way through the story, um, you were very unhappy afterwards after he let you have it. I never was subjected to that. I don't think any of my friends and engineers or Andy were subjected to that sort of treatment because we tried to be straight with him. So it was a good relationship. He was a scary guy, honestly. He was a very tough boss, but uh, I thought it was tough but fair. So um, this is just a funny story that I like to tell. Um, so this is the third year I'm at Commodore now. It's 1983, and we're at one of the big computer shows. And honestly, I don't remember if it was winter CES or summer uh, Comdex, because we did two big shows in Las Vegas every year. But the previous year, in 82, uh, we were at a show, and it was going OK. And we went out to a nice dinner at a restaurant across the street that's no longer there because it's been knocked down that whole block. And the convention center is much bigger. But it was a restaurant called Chateau Vegas. We had a nice meal there. So now a year later, we're at the show and it's going gangbusters. And we have a huge crew. We probably have 30 or 40 Commodoreans working in the booth. And there's crowds and the computers are selling like hotcakes. And we're just on top of the world having a great time. And I said to Andy, do um, you have any plans for dinner? And Andy said, no. I said, well, let's go to Chateau Vegas. And he said, OK. So a couple other guys and I decided to go to Chateau Vegas, so I called them up and made a reservation for a party of four for dinner that evening. And then half an hour passed and a few other people came up to me and said, hey, what are you guys doing for dinner? I said, well, we're going to Chateau Vegas. Oh, can we come too? Call up the phone. Can you make the party for eight instead? And, and over the course of the next few hours, it became a party of 30. <laughs> so, so we get to Chateau Vegas and I say, hi, I'm Neil Harris. I'm here with my party of 30. They go, oh, Mr. Harris, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Give us a private room in the back, big long table, put me at the head of the table. People start saying, oh, Professor Harris, Dr. Harris. <laughs> so, you know, he's got his computer company. He's doing really, really well. And I go, oh, and every, we order the, um, I think it was the Neptune's platter special. It was like all the seafood was very expensive. Every time that we've brought a course out to us, multi-course dinner, they bring me the first taste. And I'm sitting there thinking, I'm picking up the check for this thing. <laughs> and I'm a, not a senior guy in this company. I'm a middle-level manager. Um, and I'm starting to sweat. And at the other end of the table, there's a vice president of sales and all these mucky mucks. They're ordering bottles of wine. Oh. And I'm like, oh my god. And everybody's having a wonderful time except me. The food is good, and it goes on for like several hours. And the cool thing is that this is the way we got to know each other as people, right? You know, we're working together all day long in the office and working the booth at the show. But after hours, you know, you get to unwind and relax and get to know people, and it's very, very great. And this was a really terrific event. Um, but at, toward the end of the meal, I'm like, guys. There's no way that they're going to approve me expensing this multi-thousand dollar dinner at the show, even if I put the name of all 30 people that are on, the, on this list on my expense report. Thank goodness my original boss, Mike Tomchek, said, look, I can get this, this expense put through. No problem. I'll take it off your hands. Why didn't you say that two hours ago? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But anyway, we were, like I said, this was a great show. We were on top of the world. Everybody was loving it. Um, we were showing all this Commodore 64 stuff and software, and it was really a fun event. And that was, I think, probably the highlight of my time at Commodore was when we got out in public at these big shows and really pe saw people really appreciating all the work we were doing and the stuff that was going on. So, um, moving to Atari. So now we'll take you to January of 1984. Uh, I'm still at Commodore. It's the Consumer Electronics Show in January. And there's a conference room uh, with a thousand people, big auditorium. And Jack Trammell's up on the stage. And Jack Trammell is triumphantly announcing that Commodore sales have, for the last year, crossed a billion dollars. And we're the biggest selling home computer company in the world. And I'm standing in the back of the room watching this presentation, thinking, then why doesn't he look happy? I mean, this is like the triumph of, of his lifetime, and he's not looking happy. Um, and sure enough, the next week, it became clear that Jack had had a falling out with the chairman of the board, Irving Gould, and the, maybe the rest of the board of directors. The story, to this day, remains unclear exactly what went down between them, but Jack was leaving Commodore. And I mean, the culture of Commodore was Jack was the boss, right? If you had a good relationship with Jack, you basically had to get out of jail free card. If anybody else hassled you, you could go to Jack and, you know, you would be, you would be good. Um, and suddenly, he was gone. And uh, so things changed. First of all, the energy went out of the building, in my opinion. At one point, I came to my boss and said, look, I don't have stuff to do right now. I'm just sitting here like, he said, just keep your head down and look busy. Like, I've been at this company for three years. I've never had to put my head down and look busy. There's always been like, how the hell am I going to keep up with everything? And suddenly, there's nothing going on. Um, and I thought, OK, this is the, the beginning of the end. Um, we had new, new management that was brought in that had come from other industries, didn't understand the computers. Um, one thing I'll tell you that had probably become obvious over the years, Commodore liked to announce a lot of products, and many of them never actually saw the light of day. You, you may have heard this before. Um, and Jack's idea was he, he didn't believe in market research. His market research was the cash box poll. If he showed a product and people bought it, he would make it. If he showed a product and people didn't buy it, then he wouldn't make it, no harm done. Um, the new guys didn't really get that, so they, we had some products that were announced that they that didn't really go over with a uh, you know with a bang with the public, and yet they were going to go forward with it anyway. And I just really felt that this was not going to work. So then in the spring came the announcement that uh, Jack had formed a new computer company uh, with his sons. So I don't know if you're are well known anymore. Yeah, it's Leonard Trammell on the right, Sam Trammell on the bottom. He's actually much taller than that. I'm pretty sure he's sitting down. And that's Gary on the left. So Sam was at Commodore for many years as the, uh, he was working out of Asia in charge of our manufacturing organization. Leonard um, had dabbled in Commodore stuff, and I don't know if you've read any of the stuff he's written, but he created the Petsky. Uh, character set and things like that, but he was in grad school getting a PhD in astrophysics during most of the time we were at Commodore. And Gary um, was a finance guy who had had a summer job at Mr. Calculator, but really had no involvement in Commodore other than that. But they bought, they created, Jack created a company, said, uh, called Leonard, who was on his honeymoon with his wife after he got his PhD, and said, you got to come to California, we're starting a company. Um, and then a few months later, the word got out that they had bought Atari from Warner Brothers. Uh, and the word started going out to Commodoreans that if you were interested, you could call up and maybe there would be an opening for you. So I called Greg Pratt, who was the COO at Commodore and now the COO at Atari, and said, hey, I'm really thinking that it's time for me to find something else to do. And he said, we'll fly you out here right away. Um, they, they had. So an uh, old Atari had created a magazine called Atari Age, and they'd taken a lot of people's money for a lot of subscriptions. And 
they knew I knew how to do magazines because I was running Commodore Magazine and PowerPlay. Uh, and they didn't want to refund all the subscription money, so they said, do a magazine for us. And I said, I could do that. Uh, so that's what brought me out to Atari. But um, over the course of four years, almost to the day that I worked for Atari, I had 17 bosses. I'd won the first year and a whole bunch after that. I don't even remember most of their names at this point, honestly, because most of them came and went pretty quickly. Um, we turned through sales and marketing VPs at a really enormous rate. Um, the first few months at Atari were pretty ugly. I had been told by Greg that, look, what happened here is we inherited this company. It, it was falling apart. They lost a billion dollars under Warner Brothers in their last year and nearly took the Warner Brothers empire down completely. Um, and, uh, and we had to lay a bunch of people off, but we're pretty much through laying people off now. And so you can come out and I said, you just gotta, if you want me to do a magazine, you've got to not lay off the editor because I'm not an editor, I'm a publisher. I run the business side and make it work, but the editor is actually going to do the editing and find the articles. So two weeks after I joined the company, they laid off the editor uh, and, you know, things were tough. One thing that happened, one thing that happened was uh, uh, that we got a call from one of the newspapers and said, you know, you guys are clearing out your warehouses, you're selling off all this old furniture and stuff that you don't need for all these thousands of people that don't work there anymore. You sold the filing cabinet and when the person who bought it opened it up, it had the master ROMs for almost all the old <laughs> video games. Would you like them back? <laughs> yes, we would like them back. It made the newspaper, it was a, a bit embarrassing, but that, it was, it was, there was so much money still flowing out of the company that we were just trying to hunker down and keep our heads above water because the company was working on the Atari ST computer and felt really strongly that it was going to be a great thing and we just had to get, survive to the point where we could get it out the door. Um, so very tough few, few months, but we got the, we should, so January 1985, Consumer Electronics Show, we're not actually on the floor of the show because we don't want to spend that kind of money. We're in a hotel suite, but we did spend some money on some billboards saying Jack Tremell welcomes you to Las Vegas um, because we were going to show people something that was going to blow them away and we we're trying to do it economically but still make a splash. The amazing thing that happened was we were working really fast, obviously, right? A whole new computer. <coughs> from scratch to, to uh, work on a prototype in the course of about nine months. There were two chips that hadn't been working up until that show, and they had the last uh, prototype version of those chips that were flown from the production facility, the fab, uh, whatever they put them in the, in the dip, to Las Vegas, plugged into the computer, crossed their fingers, and a miracle of miracles, they both worked so the computer would work. So, we were able to show off the computer and over the course of that show we had dozens of people, men, many from other companies coming through and saying there's no way, there's no way you built this computer from scratch in this time, that's all this amazing stuff, you know, high res graphics, uh, graphical mouse oriented operating system, um, and they said, you know, there's a, there's a Sun workstation under the table and it's really what's connected to this monitor, like, okay, we had um, Electrical Engineering Times was told by one of our competitors, probably Commodore, but somebody, that, that story. So we opened up the cabinet and let them look through all the wires and make sure that it was legit and there was no Sun workstation hiding anywhere. But no, it was there and it actually worked. Um, so that's me in the lower right um, with Atari Base. So, among the many things in my portfolio, aside from the magazines, I was basically um, the person who interfaced with the user community at Atari. Uh, I was, so I shouldn't say this, but I will anyway, because I had too much coffee this morning. Um, the, Larry Niven wrote some uh, science fiction novels, and there was an alien race. And one, of the, one of the persons uh, in the race was designated to speak to inferior races, and his title was Speaker to Animals. And I always felt that that was my job at Atari. <laughs> so I, I spoke to the computer press because I kind of got it, and I thought they were important. 
I was in charge of user group support for user groups all over the country. I did online support uh, on every online service known to mankind that had accounts on Bix and CompuServe and uh, Genie. Um, the thing I was really proud of was we built this Atari online uh, BBS called Atari Base. So I had an office um, that was basically under a staircase. Nobody else wanted it, so I was able to get it. It was actually a pretty spacious office. And right next door, there was a long, narrow closet that nobody was using. So we set up a BBS in there. Um, Antic Magazine did an interview with us and did some research and said, this is probably the busiest BBS in the entire country. We're getting something like 12,000 calls a day on the system. So you see there, at this point, there's five Atari STs with monitors and hard drives. I had um, a staff of four technical support people, I'll talk about them in a second, and two volunteers. So up in the front, and next to me is Greg Cronick, and on the other side of me is Dave Flory. Uh, they're San Jose cops. Dave is a corporal, uh, and uh, I'm sorry, Greg is a corporal, Greg is a sergeant. Uh, Greg actually graduated from Harvard, and they were computer uh, enthusiasts who volunteered to come in and help on the BBS. I had four guys in tech support who also helped. And uh, the funny thing about this BBS is that this was, we didn't have a LAN at the time, right? There were no LANs for the Atari ST during that era. So there's basically five separate BBS systems with Mistron software and a five line rollover, meaning if line one is busy, you get to line two, if line two is busy, and so on. Um, and you could download software, which was a lot of what was going on. We try to get every piece of public domain software onto this board for people. Um, but you could also, there were message boards, and you could post questions, and we would come in and answer them as, as diligently as possible. But if you left a question on line three, you had to get back to line three to get the answer because it wasn't propagated over the other, over the other system. Uh, it was just the way it was, and people, people dealt with it. And, it was very popular and we were really happy about it. So let me talk about the tech support guys. So one day Jack Tramell calls me into his office and says, look at this, these people are robots. They're robots. And he hands me this sheet of paper and it's like a, I mean it's got to be a 20th generation Xerox copy <laughs> of a bunch of paragraphs with places where you can check off the answer to questions. And the one that's checked off is, I'm sorry, you asked a technical question and we don't have technical people, so we can't give you an answer. And Jack is like, you've got to fire the head of tech support, of customer support, and you take it over and make it better. This is embarrassing. If they're robots, you can't do this. They're like, okay, this was not a good answer. They shouldn't have done this. But I don't want to run that department. I'm not saying this to Jack. This is in my head. Um, because it's a no-win job. Because if you do well, you get to do it forever, and it's not that exciting. And if you don't, and if you make a mistake, which you're going to do sooner or later, you're going to send out a bad answer. Some customer is going to be upset, and Jack's going to be mad at me, and I don't like it when Jack's mad at me. But so I thought, okay, I'm just going to fix it. What do we need to fix it? Well, we've got a. a this department was built under old Atari, when they had a lot of questions about video games, and they could answer questions about video games. You know, how do I plug it in and turn it on? It was simple stuff. Now we're selling computers, the questions are hard. We need people that can answer hard questions. So I put an ad in the newspaper saying, Atari is looking for tech support people. And I ended up hiring four young men, who I'm still friendly with to this day. One was working in night shift at a supermarket. I mean, they not, weren't working in tech jobs, but they were Atari enthusiasts and had a lot of energy and they were smart. And we created this department. And I said, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to really dive deep into the computer. You're going to write a piece of software for us. And the piece of software is going to work like this. You're going to, it's going to be a, not a word processor, but a paragraph processor. Right? We're going to create paragraphs and answers, just like on all these sheets. And you're going to be able to, so the, 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 these nice young women who are answering the phones are going to be able to say, OK, we got a question. And the answer is paragraphs 4, 17, 39, and 58. And it's going to print it on the Atari letter quality laser printer and with a signature on it. And it's going to look very professional. It's not going to look like a 20th generation Xerox anymore. 
and you guys are going to write the technical answers, and if, it, if those nice people don't understand it, you're going to be the one to pick which paragraphs go in, and they created this piece of software, and, uh, and we fixed the department. I didn't have time. I didn't fire the department head, and Jack somehow let me slide on that, but I didn't want the job, really, and I didn't have to keep it, so it was fine. It worked out well for me, um, and it worked out well for them, because I know one guy, John Townsend, uh, who had the best genie handle of anybody that I, I didn't even realize it was him at first, but he was Depeche Mode. <laughs> that was awesome. Um, and he's now at Rivian. He's been with a number of great Silicon Valley companies over the years. Hopefully he's had a lot of stock options pay out for him, but you never know with those things. But um, all the guys that did great and thanked me for starting their career. But you know, all I did was get them started. They did the work. So I like to call this colorful characters, especially because the pictures are black and white. So the first picture is Jamie Copeland on the left. That was my first boss at Atari. Um, you like the 80s porn stash? Um, so Jamie was a wild man. So one night, Jamie is, is a, so Jamie and Mel Stevens, who was in charge of marketing communications, was an ex-Commodorean, about this tall and very skinny, with a very deep, with the deepest voice I ever heard. Deeper than James Earl Jones' voice, incredible, <laughs> and a little tiny guy. But anyway, the three of us are out to dinner because we're staying in the same hotel in temporary quarters before we have our actual living space as being new with the company. And uh, we're, you know, talking about how our many troubles and trying to get this company off the ground. And there's a lampshade hanging over our table, and Jamie's like had a few drinks and it's bothering his eyes, so he takes the light bulb and unscrews it a little bit so the light goes out. And after a minute or two, this very large guy comes over and says, I'm sorry, but due to safety standards and ocean, blah, 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 we can't let you turn the light off. Please turn the light back on. And he screws the light bulb back in and wanders off. And Jamie, being an ornery cuss, um, after a few more minutes, unscrews the light bulb a little bit so that the light's bothering his eyes. And sure enough, the guy comes back and says, look, you really can't do that. And Jamie's like, well, oh, you, you must not have screwed it in all the way. It went off by itself. <laughs> and the guy said, rrr, 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 and screws it back in. So about 10 minutes later, Jamie's like, screw this guy. He unscrews the light bulb, takes a penny out of his pocket, spits on it, puts it in on the light bulb, screws it back in part way. And the guy comes back. And says, rrr, rrr, and Jamie's like, I don't know, you're just not screwing it in well. So the guy screws the light bulb in there, <laughs> flash. The lights go off in that whole section of the restaurant. <laughs> and the guy is like really angry and really large. I mean, he's like the bouncer or something. He unscrews the thing. Now, the penny has now welded itself into the socket, <laughs> so he doesn't see what's going on. And uh, half an hour later, as we're starting to finish the meal, the manager of the, sh of the restaurant comes by and says, look, you probably don't want to leave yet because he's waiting for you outside. <laughs> and he's not happy. Um, and so, uh, anyway, Jamie was a sales guy at Commodore and was VP of marketing at Atari um, and hated software. Didn't understand software, wasn't a techie, was just a classic, you know, get people drunk and sell them stuff, kind of a sales guy. Um, but of course, there was a, I don't remember the name of the software anymore, I should remember this, but there was a Lotus 123 clone for the Atari ST that was gaining popularity. Um, and Jamie said, this is going to be a big money maker. So he left Atari to run that company and disappeared from my life forever at that point. So the middle picture is Greg Pratt, who I mentioned is the person that I talked to that brought me into the company and promised not to lay off my editor and laid him off anyway. And the guy on the right is David Harris, no relation, sadly, because he has more money than me, um, was the VP of sales who opened up all the big accounts of Commodore and Atari. So he opened up Kmart and Montgomery Ward and uh, all the big national accounts. He hated coming into the office. He was the kind of guy that liked living on the road, lived in Phoenix, Arizona, on, uh, I guess Scottsdale outside of Phoenix, on a, in a house on a hilltop with cacti and a beautiful French white. Um, uh, and so one day, again, I'm out to dinner, this time with Greg and, uh, and David, and I think one other person, but I can't remember who the other one is, and I'm like, this is a tough thing that we're trying to do with this company. 
this is not like Commodore, this is, and David is like, this is going to be a five-year uphill struggle to get this company really where we want it to be. And Greg is telling more stories about tough days at Commodore when they were trying to figure out how to make payroll. Uh, and we're just, you know, it's just very tough times um, trying to figure out how to get the ST to the point where it's like the Commodore 64. Uh, so these were good guys and we were, you know, we had a good crew, but it was a very tough business. So let me talk about something that's a little more fun. Um, so I told you that one of the things I did was, uh, was support user groups. Um, we had user groups all over the country, and a lot of them did things like what we're doing here this weekend, which is have user group fairs, where in our case it was Atari fairs, so they um, show off Atari software and do demos and have speakers. And we ended up supporting them in a big way where we fly people like myself and other Atari people out, and we bring in, we encourage all the major software vendors to come out and show their wares. Um, and we did this all over the country. One year, I was at 26 Atari fairs on weekends over the course of the year. So half the weekends that I'm in the year, uh, I was on the road at Atari fairs. And um, I also had figured out at that point that you don't take comp time at Atari because if you're out of the office for a few days, somebody's taken some of your job away from you. Uh, it was a little tough that way. Um, but uh, the Atari fairs were very productive for us. We showed support for the community. We helped the software companies do, uh, do as well as they could. But the other thing we did was when the show closed at the end of the day, all of us who were working in the business stuck around because we were playing games all night long. And mostly we were playing Mini Maze. Has anybody seen Mini Maze? Is it still around at all? No. So MIDI Maze was a game where you could network the Atari using the MIDI function. So you'd run a cable from one computer to another and a daisy chain around in a circle. And you could get 16 people playing a game concurrently. And you had these, these 3D happy faces. that You were one of them and everybody else was one. And they were all different colors. And you were running around in a 3D maze trying to kill each other. And it was all played with Atari joysticks. And we'd play all night and have a great time and have a chance to bond with all those people in the software business, and it was wonderful. Um, except that a few days after one of these shows and one of the marathon sessions, where frankly I did very well and killed a lot of my friends, um, I thought I was getting arthritis at a young age. Atari joysticks, you know? <laughs> Using Atari joystick for six hours in the course of a night is probably not good for your wrists and carpal tunnels. But uh, So anyway, but we had a good time and it was... Uh, it was very productive and useful, and one of the most one of the things I had the most fun with, and I was very proud of the fact that we were able to pull that all together, and that the company gave us full support to spend the money on doing this stuff, even though I didn't get any extra time off. So, um, at the end of uh, almost four years to the day after joining Atari. I was given a job offer to go work for, come back east to Genie. So I, were, um, I grew up in Philadelphia, worked for Commodore for a few years, then went to Atari in Silicon Valley. I wanted to come back east. My mother had gotten sick, my parents were getting older, and frankly, I was more of an Easterner. And plus, everybody in Silicon Valley hated us because we had laid off their friend or brother-in-law or somebody somewhere along the line. So I joined Genie, and uh, in April, a, uh, a fake press release appeared on, allegedly from Atari, and I won't say who created it, um, I know who created it, but basically it announced that the Atari had sold their 8-bit line of computers to Coleco for the grand sum of $50,000, um, that there was a new computer announced, in the, and what the press release said was the uh, Atari headquarters, uh, they decided to move Atari to headquarters to Germany to let the U.S. have a chance to do better. I thought was pretty amusing. Um, and the Atari, new Atari computer was announced, the Atari FU, with specs that were beyond, I mean, uh, you could probably get a computer with these specs today, but in uh, 1988 or 89, there was no way, right? It had basically 4K level graphic, um, and gigabytes of storage, and I mean, the spec sheet went on and on and on. And the funny thing is, for the next several weeks, calls kept coming into customer service. When's the FU coming out? <laughs> so, I thought that was a good joke. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to tell one uh, another story here. This is actually I was.
was told to only tell stories from Commodore and Atari, but I don't listen to orders that well. Um, after, I left, uh, uh, after I left Genie, I went to work at Simutronics, which was an early pioneer of online multiplayer games. Uh, Simutronics was a vendor on Atari, I got to know them, I mean on Genie, I got to know them really well. I liked playing their games, and I joined the company when there were five engineers, and they were starving to death because they had great games but terrible contracts. So I fixed the contracts and got the games up on AOL and Prodigy and CompuServe. Um, and uh, the way I did that is, so one thing that I did was, so I got to speak at a show from the Video Text Industry Association, which is, this is before there's the internet. There are a lot of online services. And I'm up on the stage and there's like a thousand people in the room because online is getting hot. And we're all doing demos and the first guy to do a demo pops a VHS tape in the machine and shows a demo of his thing. And the next person does the same thing. And me being bold, I've got the computer set up with the joysticks and the modem and I'm actually going to do a live demo of an online game called CyberStrike. CyberStrike is a game where you're in a, a giant robot and everybody else is a giant robot. You're running around this 3D terrain, which at the time was very cubic looking, um, and you're shooting each other. And it's a team game. You can have up to four players on each team, and it's run in real time on this thing. And remember, back in those days, online service graphics were not what they are today, right? Prodigy, if you remember Prodigy, used Netflix graphics where it was like the old Sierra adventure game, right? It would draw an outline and fill it in with a color, draw another outline, and each screen drawing was super slow. And here we're showing a game that's running in 3D in real time. Um, and so one of the things that I was able to do that was hard, you know, hard for me and very difficult for most people, is I'm talking to a room full of people, playing a game at the same time, and trying to actually multitask and do those both well. So I'm narrating the game and saying, okay, we're going to go into this arena and we're going to go look for other enemies and we're going to shoot at them and we're going to see what happens. And sure enough, I'm, I suddenly two enemies find me and I'm caught in the crossfire. And I'm like, I don't, so I'm actually playing against guys at our company's headquarters uh, in St. Louis and I'm in wherever I am, I forget if it was in Florida or California at the time. But anyway, it's like, I don't think they got the memo because you're about to see what it's like when I die and blow up and... And so I'm trying to zigzag out of the way, and suddenly, over my, coming from my left shoulder, my left flank, my teammate finally shows up. And so now we get the enemy robot in a crossfire. And first, the en first enemy robot blows up, and then we turn, pivot over, and the second enemy blows up and says, well, we won. And the crowd erupts, and I get a standing ovation with a thousand people in the room, and everybody's cheering and yelling, and I'm like, wow, that was great. <laughs> Honestly, couldn't have scripted it to be more dramatic and exciting than that. <laughs> Especially because this room full of people had never seen an online game work like this. I mean, those of us who are gamers had seen this on PCs, but it's very unusual. This was probably the very first true 3D multiplayer game in the market. And actually, CyberStrike was picked as online game of the year by Computer Gaming World soon after that. But the, the punchline to the story is that the, 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 at the end of the session, I'm coming off the stage and packing up my computer, and up come a group, small group of people. One is a vice president of Prodigy, and the guy is literally quivering. He's like, oh my god, I've never seen anything like that. Can you come out and show it to us? And I'm like, yeah, because my job is doing deals with people like this and getting them to write me large checks, so it's awesome. Also, there's two young ladies with them, and they're just very happy and want to be my friend. Like, oh my god, this doesn't happen to computer geeks. <laughs> so, you know, and I'm, I'm a married guy, so I'm not going there, but that was the only, the first and only time anything like that's ever happened. That must have been an awesome demo. So, uh, you know, I've had a few other demos that work well where I demonstrated the Commodore sales guys and things like that. It's kind of fun when it works well, but that's probably the hardest thing I do is play the game and have, well, you want the game to do exactly the right thing for you at the right time. So that's it. That's my stories. I have more stories, but that's what I wanted to share with you today. Uh, uh, I'll try to write up some more and post them online. Uh, does anybody have any questions for me? I have a micro microphone, so I'm going to monopolize for a minute. Okay. So, as a young teen who read literally every word of the VIC-20 manual, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for my formative computer years. 
Thank you. I oh, appreciate that. As literally every word and, and the programmer's reference guide, a lot of it. Obviously, that one is hard to eat, actually read all of it, but I'm pretty sure I haven't read all of that one either. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, that was that was great. My sister worked at Commodore in marketing back in '81 uh, or '82, and gave me a Vic 20 for my for Christmas, and <clears throat> I just was on it for hours and digested that manual. And it was so. Thank so, you. what's your sister's name? Did I know her? Well, she was in marketing. Her name was Marion McCrate. She worked for Kit Spencer. Yeah. Okay. I worked with Kit Spencer too, but I guess by that point there were enough of us where it's hard to keep track. I'm not sure, yeah. She was there probably 81, around 81. Okay. But yeah, I was there from 81 until the middle of 84. But anyway, say hello for me in case she remembers me. I'm sorry. Any other questions? Just a couple quick ones. Uh, first of all, I guess in the time period that you're with Commodore and Atari in the early mid 80s, uh, about how many employees were there, and also. Uh, Jack, he was, he was more of a business guy. Was he done a technical background? Or? Jack was not a technical guy at all. He was a, a hardcore, old school businessman. So when I joined Commodore, Commodore had done about 50 million in revenue the previous year, mostly in Europe. So the US operation was a skeleton crew. There were very few people here in the US. Um, by the time I left again, we had crossed a billion dollars and we had a pretty big crew. Um, we're, Andy and I and Jeff Bruett were talking earlier about, about the various offices that we had worked out of. But first, we were working in borrowed desks out of a sales, a regional sales, where again, where we couldn't even get equipment. Uh, and then we moved to uh, Moore Park, is that right? Moore Road. Moore Road. And then Devon Park Drive. And then Boot Road in Westchester, which was the big facility with the factory underneath and the offices up above. Um, in our, Devin, in our um, Moore Road office, we still had trouble getting equipment. We were still not the kings of the hill. The Big 20 hadn't come out yet, but we were commandos, and we were highly motivated. We loved what we were doing, right? So we're working at our desks all day long, writing software, writing manuals, doing whatever we could to make the machine a success. And we're still working into the evening, and everybody else, all the pet guys had cleared out. And so we couldn't get the equipment we wanted. We would borrow it at night, <laughs> and we were commandos, right? Uh, and then at the, end, at the next morning, they'd come in, and they were missing a cable or a printer or something, and they would requisition them and get them, and so everything worked out fine for everybody. <laughs> we couldn't do that, but we had to get our jobs done somehow. But like I said, small, small, small US presence in the beginning and very big at the end. Um, Atari had probably shrunk down to 200 employees by the time I got there. Um, from, I mean, 50 different buildings down to two. Um, was very profligate with money. In other words, um, they would send FedEx packages from one building to another, even though they were several blocks away, at a cost of $15 a piece in 1984 money, um, just burning through cash. Um, I saw some numbers that indicated that they were making projections of how many cartridges to produce for the 800 computer, and the Pac-Man sold some number of millions of, of cartridges. So when Defender was about to come out, they did 15% more, which I mean would have meant that people were buying more cartridges than there were actual computers in the field at that point. Um, so, uh, and I got to see the numbers for what happened with the ET cartridge. They produced 17 million and got 15 million back which is why they ended up in a landfill, so it was, it was crazy. Um, we built the company back up to about $400 million in revenue um, at its peak under the new Atari, but then it started sh shrinking down again. And, you know, one day Jack walked into my office. I don't know why he walked in to tell me this, but he said, you know, this ST is not gonna make it. And I'm like, what? And he said, no, it's, uh, I've seen the numbers and it's just not gonna get to where it needs to be. So. Anyway, not the happiest day I've ever had. So I'll tell you one other story that served me well, another Jack story. So Jack, again, wandered into my office um, and said, Neil, what do you want to do after you leave Atari? And I said, well, what I thought I'd do is stay here uh, for a few years, make money from the stock options, and start my own software company. And he said, no, 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 you're doing it all wrong. I said, what do you mean? He said, you have to do it when you don't have two nickels to rub together. 
and you watch every penny, and you, that's the way you build a business and make it work. And sure enough, when I left GE and started with Simutronics, I didn't really have two nickels to rub together at that point. We had a company, we had a little bit of revenue, we were barely enough to pay the rent. Um, but I watched every penny and I signed every check for the next 17 years that I worked there. Uh, and, you know, we built it up and we had good products and just it took to make the company successful and make it grow. We hit the Inc. 500 list, we peaked at about 20 plus million in revenue. We were the number one game company on AOL, Prodigy, CompuServe, and Genie in terms of revenue per month. Um, and, you know, we had a good ride to put my kids through college. You know, the ride goes in different directions, but it was good for 15 years and not so good for the last two, but, you know, it worked out okay. Questions? Yes? So can I ask you a magazine editorial question? Sure. So, because, uh, like, the magazines I followed back in the day, and also like some of some of yours, like, also seem to have a kind of battle between teaching people programming and then teaching them assembly, teaching them basic, versus like reviewing software or reviewing games. So how did you figure that balance out? Well, that's a good question, and I'm not sure I have a great answer for you. It was more about what, it, what material we could get that was good, that we felt strongly about. I mean, we, all those elements were the important things, right? We, needed, we had basic people and assembler people, and people that wanted reviews of games and other software. Uh, and we needed the balance, and also just articles about what you do with computers in general. Um, the way we read Commodore and PowerPlay is we would sit down once a year and plan out the issues for the rest of the year, what the themes were going to be, and then we went out and solicited articles. But I mean, an article, somebody wrote a, a, an interesting basic program, and it came over the transom and it didn't fit the theme of the issue, we would absolutely run it. Um, but, you know, we did an education issue and a, a telecommuting issue and things like that. That was the way we planned out so that we could go out and look for writers to create the articles that we were looking for. And we built a, we built a cadre of writers that were reliable for us. Some were well-known in the industry, some were local people that we just knew could write and would do, you know, if we gave them the theme, they would come up with something that would be worthwhile. Question way over here. Can you tell us anything about the motive for the Atari FU fake press release without revealing the identity of the author? That was just funny. <laughs> you know, I mean, the thing about Atari was, and it was true at Commodore as well, is that uh, it seemed that. The, that wherever you were, there was some other part of the world that was doing better. So that was, I think, the motivation behind saying we'd move the headquarters somewhere else so that this part of the country would do better. Um, I think the FU part was more about um, Atari's proclivities for announcing products that weren't actually coming out yet. But, I mean, I think the funny thing is, it was one of those things like the story about boiling a frog, right? You can, Put a frog in hot water, it'll jump out, but if you put it in cold water and heat up the water, and then it'll just stay there until it boils. Um, the, that particular press release started off slight, uh, a little bit absurd, but slightly realistic, and then got more and more absurd as you went by, and it just sucked people in to the point where they believed it, even though the specs on this computer really were like not possible, especially that long ago. So, but the fact that people, I, I think. I mean, when I read it, I didn't expect people would be calling us all right looking for it. I thought they'd have to be It took a while before they figured out that this was a joke. It was dated April 1st. Or <laughs> 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 10 years later, question. How did the Amiga affect, affect that timeline where, where you were rushing the ST to market in an amazing nine months? So, two separate projects, except actually. So, um, I mean, we need to get it out of the door fast because we were bleeding money and we needed revenue, right? We were selling off old inventory of Atari, uh, Atari VCS computer uh, video game machines and old Atari computers. We were busy trying to revamp the lineup and get new stuff out the door, um, but we were hemorrhaging cash. Um, and so, aside from what Commodore was
was doing, we knew Commodore was in competition uh, in, our, in our niche. Uh, we didn't exactly have insight in terms of what their timeline was going to be for the Amiga, but we obviously knew it was coming because it was originally going to be an Atari product under the old regime. Um, but we just needed to get it out the door because we needed revenue. If I recall, at some point, uh, was an Atari far more successful in Europe um, than, than the US? Uh, so, and the answer is I don't actually know. I know Commodore was much more successful in Europe than, than in the U.S. in Europe in the pet days. Um, but in terms of Atari ST, I mean, there was, I don't know, I, don't, I honestly didn't have a lot of insight into the European markets. I'll tell you one more funny story, uh, and then we'll go. Um, so, this is the story that the Termel family told me. So they're in negotiations with Warner Brothers to buy the company. And it's Friday night, and it's getting late, and it's like 3 o'clock in the morning, and they finally reached an agreement on terms. And in order to secure the deal, cash and money needs to change hands. And like, how is money going to change hands at 3 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday morning? And Gary Chanel, who was a stockbroker at the time at Merrill Lynch, pulls out an Amex card from his pocket and says, this Amex card is backed up by the Chanel family holdings at Merrill Lynch, which is a $100 million balance. And everybody had a good laugh, and they took a credit card machine, and they went, chee chee, $27 million. And that sealed the deal. Now, of course, they didn't actually run that through the, the computer system on Monday. There was a cashier's check or some such like that, but um, Atari was actually, uh, the deal was secured by an American Express black card. All right, I think that's the last funny story for today. If you invite me back again, I'll try to come up with some more. Thank you very much.